Hey everybody, welcome back to Young Engineers of Today. Hope you had a good weekend, and uh, well, hope you're ready to continue. This may be our last class that has um, sort of a regular um, class style to it. Uh, the next, we continue with where we did synthetic biology and biotechnology. Um, so this stuff, uh, which we'll be continuing with today. Um, but this might be the last class that we have that has like sort of a normal format to it. Um, the next one might be also a lecture class, but we might be going over stuff that's different from uh, from what we've been going over today. I don't know. It remains to be seen. Either way, uh, we'll figure something out um, because I am not entirely sure if we'll get through everything today, but we might. Um, and anyway... I hope you are ready to continue. So, um, last time around we talked about more synthetic biology. We looked at the, the finite state machines, um, basically what they are and, and how we can make bacteria be finite state machines. Uh, in this case, it was the bacterial edge detector, which showed the, the edges between light and dark uh, and highlighted those, essentially. Um, talked a bit about... No worries, Andrew. It happens. Uh, we talked a little bit about GMOs uh, in a general sense, but mostly, I guess, in the, in the food sense. Uh, we talked a little bit about biological clock. This is a very short one, so that was mostly just me sort of expounding upon it. Um, and we spent some time talking about DNA and HGP. I believe we actually stopped uh, in this area. Let me see here. Yeah, it looks like, it looks like this is where we stopped. So anyway, um, DNA, we talked about DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. Um, we talked about what DNA sort of is, well, it's a collection of proteins and things like that, uh, the specific combination of which uh, is the instructions for making you, in essence. Um, it has a list of instructions for building individual cells, uh, even how those cells function and things like that. Um, it is also useful for sort of gleaning our, our genetic history because, of course, we whatever we have in common with um, other life forms, we can, we can look at DNA to see what exactly is, what exactly is similar and things like that. Um, so yeah, this, this quote here actually was, was a very poetic way of putting it, but it was, it was an appropriate one. Uh, it's a history book, a narrative of the journey in our species through, species through time. It's a shop manual with an incredibly detailed blueprint for building every human cell. And it's a transformative textbook of medicine with insights that will give healthcare providers immense new powers to treat, prevent, and cure disease. Uh, so not only does it give us instructions for, you know, building a cell and things like that, it also gives us clues as to how those cells are going to act and perform and, you know, what, what health problems might arise in the future and things like that. Um, We've seen that before in, in determining, you know, genetic markers for various diseases uh, and seeing how a gene can get sort of messed up and cause diseases, things like that. Um, but that's that's one of those things that, that uh, DNA is very useful for. Uh, DNA is made up of four different bases um, that can be only paired up in a specific way. We can't have you know, we can we cannot pair them up however we'd like. Um, we've got thymine, adenine, guanine, and cytosine. I'm sure I'm pronouncing at least one of those incorrectly, um, but I've never actually heard them pronounced before, so <laughs> there you go. Um, adenine can only be paired with thymine, and guanine can only be paired with cytosine. So if you see a C, you're going to see a G as well. If you see an A, you're going to see a T as well. Um, they're always going to be paired up with one another. Uh, now, the specific ordering of those pairings, excuse me, uh, the specific ordering of those pairings is what determines, um, you know, the, the, the makeup of DNA, the, 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 the genetic code. Um, just because 
you only have two separate two different kinds of pairs um, the fact is there exists three billion pairs in um, the human genome so three billion pairs of AT and C G means that there is a pretty big variance. Now, in addition, uh, it should be said that most of the DNA that exists within uh, a person is similar, very, very similar. Well, it's identical. Most of the DNA, the overwhelming majority of the DNA in a person is identical to uh, that of another person. In fact, 99.9% um, .9 of uh, a DNA sequence in any one person is going to be identical. Same 99.9%. .9 Only 0.1% has the potential to be different, and that determines stuff like you know hair color and uh, you know uh, uh, hair color, eye color, skin color, build, uh, you know how how quickly you grow, uh, metabolism, you know things like that. You know how well you can <laughs> how well you can process certain kinds of foods and things like that, like dairy and stuff. Um, all of those things that make people individuals is all encoded within that 0.1%, which is what, 300,000? 3 million. It's 3 million. Um, yes, 3 million uh, base pairs. Um, so 3 million of the 3 billion base pairs that exist on a person uh, can vary from person to person. And those are the ones that determine what makes you you. And, I mean, we're all aware of how different a person can be from another person. <laughs> People tend to be very uh, unique looking, uh, even within the same, um, you know, family. And they're going to share a lot more of their DNA amongst one another than, say, two people from opposite sides of the world. So, even though we only have two possibilities for um, base pairs, the fact that three million of them can differ means that there is a whole lot of, um, of possibility. So how, what makes one cell different from one another? Well, DNA, obviously, the life instructions of the cell. Um, yeah, diversity. Yeah, exactly. Um, now, a gene is an individual segment of DNA. Uh, and then you've got alleles, which are um, different sections of genes. I don't understand why they cut this picture off. Yeah, one or two... One of two or more different versions of a gene. Okay. It's interesting that they decided to do that because I really feel like it could have benefited from being up here and cut off up here. Let's run with that. There, that looks much better. Um, I'll be Alleles are one or two, one of two or more different versions of a gene. Um, they're not, they're not parts of a gene. Excuse me. And as you can see, very, very small differences uh, can, in fact, create um, mutations. So. As you can see, we've got the, the normal type red blood cell, which is, you've seen those in pictures before. It's the, sort of the, it looks kind of like a donut with the middle filled in or like a, like a life raft or something like that. Um, in the genetic sequence up here, we've got CTG, ACT, CCT, GAG, GAG, AAG, TCT. Then here, the A and the T have been flipped because this is this is showing one side of uh, a chain. You know, we're not listing the 
the entire pair because that's sort of redundant. If we've got a C here, we know that there's going to be a G afterwards. If we've got a T here, we know that there's going to be an A afterwards. So we just list the leading part of the pair in order to, uh, you know, basically cut the length of a of a of a a gene in half when we write it out. Uh, so in this case, it's GAG, which creates the normal hemoglobin, the normal blood cell. Over here, it's GTG. So simply the A and the T have switched. It's not even that the A and the T have been replaced with a, with a C and a G. It's just that the A and the T have switched positions. And that's enough to create abnormal blood cells, abnormal red blood cells, with things like anemia and things like that. So it's pretty amazing to think that such a tiny change can create such a difference in the overall structure of whatever it has the instructions for. Now, in order to better understand this, there is the Human Genome Project, which is actually a thing that's, um, we've already sequenced all of a human genome. Um, we're actually looking to understand it better. But yeah, so to sequence, i.e. determine the exact order of nucleotides, A, T, C, and G, for all of the DNA in a human cell and also to determine which sections of DNA represent individual genes to figure out what parts are genes and what exactly they do. Um, decoding the language of the human genome, essentially. Figuring out where the words are and what the words mean. And also reading a sentence, essentially. But the Human Genome Project is an international effort. Um, it's, it's being done all over the world and it's being worked on all over the world. And again, it's trying to f figure out exactly what makes a human work genetically, what makes a human tick. Uh, but how, how it was sequenced was DNA samples were collected from thousands of volunteers. And then the samples were sent to these centers across the world. And then the scientists at the centers um, perform DNA sequencing, not just, they don't just perform DNA. Okay, that one's, that one's been already cropped before. Um, they, they performed DNA sequencing. They, they, they pulled out the base pairs and everything like that. Now, the human genome is the complete set of genetic information for humans, Homo sapiens sapiens. Uh, the information is encoded as DNA sequences within the 23 chromosome pairs in cell nuclei and in a small DNA molecule found within individual mitochondria. Now, again, these, uh, these DNA pairs, the chromosomes, uh, everybody's got 23 of them, uh, again, barring any sort of genetic mutation. Um, but, you know, I guess normally developed humans would have, uh, 23 chromosomes. Now, the Human, Human Genome Project was an immense international enterprise. Uh, it was actually probably the biggest, that's not an exa that's not an exaggeration, but in saying it's probably the biggest biological experiment yet attempted. Um, Researchers work together to read the entire sequence of uh, DNA bases in the human genome, which again, as we've established before, are more than 3 billion of them. Um, so imagine reading a book that was 3 billion words long. It would take a while. It'd be good to get, you know, some of your friends together and, uh, you know, read this part of the book and read this part of the book and read that part of the book and maybe have some overlap so you can figure out where it all fits together in the greater scheme of things and everything like that. And, you know, to find out what exactly is different. A lot of links, a lot of links. Anyway, the Human Genome Project, they've, they've managed to sequence a, few, uh, uh, a human genome, but... Um, we're still at the point where we don't know exactly what everything does. Now we're on to forensics, which is related to DNA, and uh, you might know exactly why, or you know, maybe maybe you don't, but you'll see. Now forensics. Well, okay, let's let's put it like this. Um, the word forensic comes from the Latin word forensis, um, but that's not really helpful. The, when, we, when we speak of forensics or forensic, uh, we say that it's relating to, used in, or suitable to a court of law. So uh, essentially sort of this law science kind of 
Um, any science used for the purposes of law is a forensic science. But how could that be related to DNA? Well, there's forensic DNA analysis, um, basically analyzing the DNA at a crime scene to match it up with the DNA of a suspect or not in order to either uh, gather evidence against them or, uh, you know, for the for them. Yeah, he is. He's, I mean, he's super happy, though. <laughs> So uh, basically, forensic DNA analysis relies on these two facts. Every individual, except identical twins, has a unique DNA sequence. And each cell in an individual contains the same DNA sequence. Um, well, that's true. That's a good point. It may not, you know. Maybe this is two sides of the same picture and she's just super nervous about how he's smiling at her. Anyway, um, these aren't exactly 100% accurate. I mean, excuse me, there are small mutations which can exist um, between identical twins and even between identical, like uh, two cells in your body. Um, which means that the, it's not always going to be 100% accurate, but it's it's reliable enough to be used in a court of law. But DNA analysis can help solve crimes. It can identify human remains, like missing for missing persons or disasters, and it can determine relationships between family members for paternity cases and child abductions. Um, fun stuff. Totally fun stuff. But, you know, these are the kinds of things that DNA can be used for, and it's actually a huge boon for that kind of stuff. Um, figuring out a murder case or figuring out if that person, the, the, that body is, in fact, somebody who's been missing for, you know, a few months now. Uh, determining whether or not uh, this person has was actually, like, you know, is this person is actually this child's father or something like that. And essentially it just involves collecting DNA evidence from a crime scene and comparing the DNA from a suspect. Now, the again, the thing is, this is used in a court of law. It's important to note that it's not cut and dry. You know, if there is a match, it's possible that they, you know, committed the crime possible. If there's no match, then, you know, there's like a 99% chance that they, they didn't. Um, but if there is a match, there is, there is a possibility that they did, but it's not 100% guaranteed. Um, it just means that that's another avenue that can be explored. Uh, and they might be on the right track, that sort of thing. Why might it not be 100% reliable. If they do find a match, why why is that not necessarily why does that not necessarily automatically mean that that person is guilty? That's true, it could have been forged. What else do you think? Could have messed up. Yeah, there's that too. There's also the possibility that that person was there sometime before the crime happened and they accidentally left some DNA there. Like maybe, you know, you work as a server or something like that. Uh, well, no, let's say this. You work as like a, in like a machine shop and you cut your finger on a piece of metal and you bleed a little bit on the floor. Or yeah, or a piece of hair falls off or something like that. And then a crime is committed there later that night and they find your DNA there. Well, you certainly didn't commit that crime. But... Your DNA is there. So that's why it's possible, you know, that the person may not have committed the crime. Because there could be forgery. And there could be errors in the in the way that the DNA is sequenced, which we'll get into a little bit later, I believe, actually. There, there is something that, that talks a little bit about why it might have not been a perfect, you know, why there, there is room for error in a, in a DNA sequencing. 
finding the DNA evidence, well, we leave cells behind wherever we go. DNA can be isolated from all sorts of things, skin, saliva, blood, hair. Um, you can lick an envelope and leave some of your DNA behind, and they can use that. Uh, modern laboratory methods can get useful DNA information from just a few cells, so like a drop of blood or the a partially licked envelope, um, clothes that you've worn, things like that. And again, as we've established before, the DNA sequences of any two people are 99.9% .9 identical. That's one difference out of every 1,000 nucleotides. So yeah, about 3 million nucleotide differences in the entire genome. There are certain variable regions that exist um, in individuals. There are, sort of, there are sort of regions of DNA that are reliably different, or reliably unique, at least. Um, and those are ones that they tend to focus on. So forensic DNA analysis focuses on one type of variability, short tandem repeats. Short tandem repeats are just, as you can see, sequences here that repeat for a short period of time. TAGC, 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 TAGC. I was going to say etc. at some point, but I got about this far, and I was like, well, I might as well commit and just say the rest of them. Um, but yeah, so the sequences like these where there's uh, sort of a sequence of, of base pairs that repeats, uh, there, are, there are a short sequence of base pairs, and they don't tend to repeat a whole lot, but, you know, they do. And individuals can have different numbers of repetitions. Most SDRs used for forensic DNA analysis can contain between 4 and 20 repeats. Then they've got this this um, this technique. It's not it's not one that they use to. It's not something they're looking at. Uh, I should say it like this. It's not something that naturally occurs in DNA that they use to identify one from another. It's actually what they use in order to expand a strand of DNA in order to have more to work with. Basically, they're replicating the DNA so that they have more to work with and more to test on. It's called pr polymerase chain reaction. Uh, basically, you heat the DNA strands to separate them, and then you um, attach some primers and then make copies of a target sequence. So the polymerase copies the target sequence, and then you repeat the process to make many more copies of the target sequence. And then you have more DNA to work with for purposes of DNA sequencing and testing. The PCR primers attach to DNA sequences on either side of the repeats. Uh, these regions do not vary between individuals, so the, 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 the regions that denote the beginning and end of, a uh, of, a, of an STR, uh, they will be identical between people. And the same primers can amplify the repeat region in any individual, so they can, they can uh, extend that, that, the length of that repetition and have more of it. Then there's also gel electrophoresis. Um, which basically compares DNA fragments of different sizes. Um, if you if you put them in a, a bunch of gel and, and apply an electrical current, because DNA itself is also has a slight electrical charge to it, it will recede from that negatively charged side. Now, since this is not air, this is in fact a gel, there is, you know, um, friction and stuff like that to worry about, which smaller sequences of, smaller fragments of DNA won't have to worry about, uh, but larger fragments will. And so as a result, after a certain period of time, the smaller fragments, since they will move faster, will have gotten further through the gel than the larger fragments. Everyone inherits two copies of each STR, one from your mother and one from your father. The human genome contains thousands of these STRs. And for a forensic investigation, the FBI has chosen 13 of the most reliable STRs, plus a marker called 
uh, AML or AML, which detects gender. And using using a standard set of markers that they can use, it allows them to have information be shared at the local, state, and federal level because it, it still keeps at least um, it standardizes everything so that there's there's a baseline to work with. Um, it keeps some anonymity as well, uh, but mostly it's you can let's say you know somebody's committed a crime in Nevada. Well, considering that they had previously committed a crime in uh, Pennsylvania, and there was there was some uh, DNA, there was some forensic DNA testing that happened there, and their their DNA was was put on file there. Uh, well, Pennsylvania can share their um, DNA profile of the suspect to Nevada, and Nevada can compare the same STRs um, to determine whether or not there's a match. So it allows that sort of uh, allows that sort of standardization across the board. DNA profile is the number of repeats an individual has in both copies of all 13 STR markers plus the AML. Uh, the probability of two unrelated people sharing a DNA profile is about one in a billion. About one in a billion. There are what, seven billion people on this planet right now? Um, that means that there are potentially uh, six or seven other people on this planet who share the same DNA profile as far as is concerned with you. So that's another reason why it's not entirely foolproof because it's not looking at the entire uh, genome in order to, to uh, determine individuality. There is there is sort of areas that they look at. Now granted, one in a billion is an insanely low set of odds. It's not like, you know, Tomorrow you're going to be wrongfully accused of a crime because somebody who did has like their their STRs match up with yours perfectly or something like that. The odds of that happening are just just astronomically low, absurdly low. But it is something that does happen, and that's another part of the reason um, that you know you can't fully hold someone culpable or responsible for committing a crime because there is that chance. Yeah, essentially. Then there's the, the CODIS, which is the Combined DNA Index System, uh, which is sort of a, a whole UI. Uh, it's computer software that includes, a, uh, that inter interfaces with DNA profile databases. Um, which allows you to either, you know, be able to match a, a DNA result with a criminal or match a DNA result with a missing person, things like that. Look at that police sketch. I don't think that's really a thing that people do anymore, is the police sketch stuff. I think that's all computerized now. Anyway, um, as far as the as the criminal database is concerned, there are 6.7 million profiles in there. Um, now, at, at the time of creating this uh, slideshow. It's important to note that DNA collection is legal in all 50 states and eligible crimes for DNA collection vary state by state. State to state. So that's those are those are two, you know, important things to note. Even though um, it is legal to collect DNA if a person has committed a crime, the nature of the crime can vary from state to state that warrants DNA collection. Now, forensic evidence collected from crime scenes about a half a million, or a third of a million, quarter of a million, quarter of a million, jeez. Uh, but again, these numbers could be different. An arrestee is a 
legal for field, uh, yeah, anyway. Now, as far as missing persons index, indexes are concerned, or indices, um, it's good for, you know, finding missing persons, identifying unidentified remains. Um, you can rely on biological relatives of missing persons in order to help nail down uh, whether or not this person was in fact missing because children do inherit DNA from their parents, as we all know. Uh, so close relatives have many markers in common. Um, so it could be that if you don't have a direct DNA profile of a person who is missing, you can rely on the parents' DNA profiles uh, in order to get pretty close. As of February 2009, good lord. Uh, as of February 2009, CODIS has aided in more than 84,700 investigations. It's a lot. Uh, forensic to forensic matches, which are, this is one of the things that, that uh, forensics can use. So forensic to forensic matches links DNA evidence from more than one crime scene, allowing investigators to pool resources and catch serial offenders. Um, serial being, you know, multiple. So a serial offender is somebody who, who consistently will commit uh, crimes, hence like serial killer and stuff like that. They don't just murder once, they murder many times, so they are a serial killer. They were a peep killer. It's you know a lovely topic to talk about. But anyway, forensic to criminal matches um, tend to help provide a suspect for a crime, uh, as opposed to um, so you're you're comparing a, a, a forensic scene to a person in that case, as opposed to comparing two different crime scenes to see if maybe the same perpetrator uh, committed the crime. Whether or not you know who that perpetrator is is a different story, but if you can match the DNA at two, you know, different crime scenes and you can go, hey, the same person was here. Probably. And then you can work on trying to match those, that DNA profile with somebody. So if there's a match between a suspect and forensic evidence, investigators typically do follow-up DNA analysis to confirm the match, and other evidence is also included before a conviction is made. Did the suspect have a motive to commit the crime? Can they account for their whereabouts during the crime? Is there other physical evidence le linking the suspect to the crime? And is there another explanation for finding the suspect's DNA at the crime scene? Um, in this case, you know, it, it's part of a tool that's used along with everything else in order to determine uh, a person's guilt or innocence. Um, it is not the one end all and be all tool, uh, and this is this has been pretty much the case uh, with everything with the advent of new technology. It's it's meant to be another tool to aid in the investigation or in the doing of whatever. If a DNA from a suspect does not match forensic evidence, well, it essentially eliminate, eliminates the suspect from the investigation. It also does tend to save investigators time and money, and saves the suspect's time and hassle. Hassle is a polite way of putting it. Um, the avoiding the prospect of being prosecuted for a crime you did not commit. I feel like hassle is not strong enough of a word for that. In fact, going through an investigation and being detained for a time until they determine that you're not the person who committed it, the crime, hassle is not strong enough of a word. But, you know, hassle. Uh, DNA evidence must be handled carefully. Modern analysis tools are very sensitive to contamination from other sources of human DNA, and samples are vulnerable to contamination and degradation by bacteria or mold. So, um, you know, it's very, it can be very easy if investigators aren't careful to accidentally add DNA from other people, including themselves, into a sample uh, and, and basically contaminate the sample. Um, and it's also possible for them to just get destroyed by bacteria or mold. So for that reason, evidence should be properly packaged and sealed. Evidence should be handled as little as possible. Anyone handling evidence should be providing or should be wearing protective gloves and document everyone who handles the sample and who could potentially have contaminated it with their DNA. You want to take a note of the fact that you handled the sample because if nobody knows you did and your name comes up as somebody who was there at the scene of the crime, well, isn't that a little awkward? Then we worry about the aforementioned hassle.
So DNA evidence has not only helped to implicate persons in a crime, or or not implicate, but um, identify persons involved in a crime. It's also been used to overturn convictions, wrongful convictions in the past. So. Um, 1987 DNA profile analysis was first used in a criminal case. 1989 DNA profile analysis was first used to exonerate a man wrongly accused of a crime. So he was he was accused of a crime in the past. He was prosecuted for it. DNA analysis after the fact was allowed allowed them to be like, hey, this guy did not actually commit this crime. As of April 14th, 2009, 235 convictions have been overturned by DNA evidence, and that number is most assuredly higher than. Um, than it was then. There are innocence projects that exist, um, which are, are basically looking to eliminate as many wrongful convictions as they possibly can uh, by using DNA, uh, forensic DNA analysis. So, you know, because if, if, it's, if it's at all possible to exonerate somebody who has been wrongly accused of it in the past, well, if the chance is there, it seems worth doing, doesn't it? So old evidence is often kept in storage. Some of this old evidence, such as hair and blood and such, contain DNA. Now, many of these samples were analyzed using older techniques, such as microscopic analysis of hair and blood typing now. But DNA profiles have been obtained from decades-old samples. So they've been able to, you know, whereas in the past they might do blood typing, blood typing tends to be a lot more common. Um, you know, I'm O negative. Even being O negative, I know that there is a significant number of people in the world who share my blood type. Um, so it was it was a it was a useful tool back then. It's still a useful tool today, although it's made a bit more obsolete by DNA sequencing. Um, but just like how DNA sequencing is, it was not a perfect you know, silver bullet for implicating somebody in a crime. Um, in fact, more so. No. In addition to that, samples that were present in insufficient quality or poor quality uh, using old techniques are revisited using modern techniques. So modern techniques can get DNA profile information from much smaller samples. So older methods required high quality sample about the size of a dime. Um, modern methods can contain or can obtain a DNA sample from microscopic samples containing just a few cells. So we're talking a fraction of a percent of the original amount of uh, DNA necessary. Not the head of the pin, but the point of the pin. DNA analysis has also helped to identify disaster victims. So, you know, personal items such as hairbrushes and razors and things like that have been able to um, identify disaster victims so that at least the people who know can be, you know, provided some sort of closure. Things like that. Now, advances in DNA sequencing. How has DNA sequencing changed since it first became a thing? Well, oops. Um, recently, uh, there have been, you know, some pretty big advances in, in sequencing. Here's Dr. James Watson, Watson and Crick being the two who are generally credited with co-discovering the structure of the DNA. The, co the, the structure of DNA. Did I say the DNA? I didn't really mean to. Anyway, uh, 2006, draft of rhesus macaw genome complete, $22 million. Cost $22 million in order to do that. Two months later, a private company so sequences Watson's DNA. Cost less than a million dollars. 2008, the world's largest sequencing center, Sequences the equivalent of 300 human genomes in just over six months. And then in late 2008, a handful of private companies claim to have tools that can sequence an entire human genome for $4,000 to $10,000. Nowadays, you've got like, you know, stuff like 23andMe and 
stuff that you know you can you can send your like a sample of your dog's hair into in order for them to to you know sequence it and you can you can send that stuff into 23 and me in order to have your own dna sequence and again it's one of those things where it's like you know you can't take this as as like a scientific analysis there's always that that disclaimer and everything like that but then they could be like hey you know so we can tell you have brown eyes and uh you have viking ancestry and you know and so on and so forth so that, that, that's always kind of a fun thing and those things don't you know cost four thousand to ten thousand dollars they don't tend to be cheap um by you know uh standard living but it's it's not like this 1980s before the human genome project sequencing technology was labor intensive and used hazardous radioactive chemicals well doesn't that sound just like a blast however in the 1990s you know there was a there was a new sequence um or sequencing technology called die terminator sequencing um that made the human genome project feasible uh, it required fewer reactions for each sample, uh, more of the steps could be automated, uh, and additional improvements over the years cut the cost and increased the speed of it. So uh, the Human Genome Project ended up finishing uh, under budget and ahead of schedule. Now we have next generation, well, we're, we're working on next generation sequencing technology that require fewer hands on steps, faster reaction times, fewer expensive reagents, more reactions at once. Many next generation sequencing methods work on single molecules of DNA. So you've got nanopore sequencing where bases are read electronically as DNA moves through a tiny pore. So it's kind of like, um, kind of like the supermarket scanner, sort of, kind of, um, you know, how there's a, there's a barcode on something at the supermarket and they run over the thing and it goes, boop. Because you know the the thing reads the barcode and the computer interprets it. Same basic idea. You're running it over a over a scanner, except in this case, it's a tiny, 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 tiny hole in uh, you know a, a surface, and then it's read electronically as it goes through that. Um, sequence by synthesis. Special bases release pulses of light as they're added. So remember this whole um, this whole bit. Uh, about replicating the DNA, the poly polymerase chain reaction. Well, imagine doing that, except as the DNA is being duplicated, it releases a, just a, a pulse of light. Um, so, like, you know, if it's, if it's A, it'll release this specific pulse of light. If it's T, it'll release this specific pulse of light, so on and so forth. And that can be read, and then that can be used in order to build a DNA sequence. Now, in 2004, the NIH created funding opportunities for developing new, faster, cheaper sequencing technology. That was 12 years ago, but I'm sure it still applies today, almost 13 years ago. The goal now is to sequence a human genome for $1,000 by 2014, which I believe is actually a thing that's already happened. Uh, next generation sequencing technologies are very close to reaching this goal as of 2009, which I'm pretty sure that happened. Then there's also $10 million to whomever can create a machine that will sequence a human genome, or 100 human genomes, in 10 days at the cost of less than $10,000 per genome. This is an entirely different contest funded by not the NIH, the National Institute for Health. This is funded by, uh, I, don't, I don't know, Archon Genomics, I guess. Now, the $1,000 genome will make it possible for genome sequencing to become a routine medical test. Though it's one of those things where it's like knowing what could go wrong with your body, you might not, you might be better off not knowing. <laughs> or you might be happier not knowing. It might be good to know from a, from a medical standpoint, but you might be happier not knowing. You know, imagine somebody told you like you, you were at a, at a high risk for Parkinson's or something like that, and you spent the rest of your life worrying about it. You know, is it is it good to have that knowledge, or does it hang over your head like a like a like a sentence? And I guess that that, that all depends upon how you and handle it as well. There's a there's a movie, uh, Gattaca. Uh, Ethan Hawke and Jude Law, and uh, Uma Thurman, I believe. And it's that's a, it's actually a very very good movie, and it's it's this whole idea that in the future. Um, sort of like designer babies are made. People are people sequence, you know, specific um, uh, genes and things like that. They, they, they create a whole, 
a whole genome for a, for a baby based on the parents, but the baby is essentially genetically perfect given the source material. Um, you know, all the flaws are removed and everything like that. Um, and not everybody can afford it, so there are people out there who are they're known as naturals and things like that. Um, but because there are these genetically perfect people that exist, well, um, everything in life is sort of determined by your genetic sequence. You know, you 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 go for a job interview and they 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 sequence your DNA to see if you're worthy, that kind of thing. So there's a, there's a um, a discrimination aspect to it. And Ethan Hawke is a natural, and it's all about how. Um, first of all, it's kind of like it's a thriller, like somebody gets somebody gets murdered and his DNA is there even though he's using somebody else's DNA and it's 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 one of those things you have to watch um, basically answers a bunch of questions or asks a bunch of questions about the human condition you know would you be better off knowing that you're genetically perfect um, can you expand beyond your genetic limitations um, things like that it's it's a very interesting movie plus like he gets in the end um, it's all about like getting to go to space. So that's cool. I like space too. Getting to be an astronaut to go to Jupiter. Cause that's like his whole like end goal is to be able to do that. Uh, anyway, I won't reveal what happens, but it's, it's an interesting movie. But yes, um, they'll be able to compare a patient's genome to normal and disease genomes and be able to predict whether a patient is likely to develop a disease, make an early diagnosis, they can recommend measures for treatment or disease prevention, and they can prescribe medications based on an individual's genetic makeup. Because people can react differently to different medications based on their genetic sequences. Um, somebody can be allergic to something, or they can, they can you know, have <coughs> excuse me, an adverse reaction in some way or another. And being able to know those things beforehand can help a doctor avoid, um, you know, prescribing medication that somebody would have an adverse reaction to. Improved sequencing technologies will be an important part of many other projects. In addition to that, um, understanding understanding human genetic variation and how it relates to disease will be one of those things. Um, characterizing microbes and how they interact in ecosystems, another one. Um, comparative genome projects. So seeing how a uh, human's genome differs from a gorilla's genome, how, seeing how a cat's genome differs from a tiger's genome, um, you know, even though those two comparisons aren't necessarily fair. Um, seeing how a dog's genome compares to a monkey's genome, things like that. Uh, model organism genome analysis, so creating a, creating a specific genome and being like, okay, so how does this, how might this organism act? And then they can, they can build like virtual organisms and determine how they're going to perform based on their understanding of genomes. Scientists being they, researchers and doctors and stuff. Um, anyway, it's 7.52. Um, this seems as good a point as any to take a break because we've got the Humor Microbiome Project. We might be coming back to this on Wednesday. We might not be. Um, if we do, we'll, we'll pick right up where we left off and go through all of this and then, you know, that'll be a fun thing. Um, if not, well, we'll go into an entirely new topic for Wednesday. That's just going to be a one-off thing for Wednesday. Um, and then, you know, we'll, we'll break for the winter and, and meet up again in, uh, in January. But as it stands right now, um, I want to leave it open to question and answer time, give you guys enough time to, to ask any questions you might have. Uh, also do the poll questions because I know a lot of you guys are very excited about those things. Um, and then that, you know, as always leaves me some time to get prepared for my, for my high school class. So, uh, poll questions, question and answer. Uh, otherwise, you know, have a wonderful weekend.